All right. Uh, it's 7 o'clock in Lima, Peru, 5 p.m. in Tucson, Arizona. I think we're ready to begin. There's more than 100 people already here. And there's some more coming in. But we should probably start. Good evening, everybody. My name is Omar Aguapara, and I am the head of the political science department here at UPC in Lima, Peru. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. Tonight, we inaugurate our series of international brownback seminars, and we are honored to have Dr. Gerald Jerry Goss as our first distinguished guest. Dr. Goss is currently the James E. Rogers Professor of Philosophy and Head of the Department of Political Economy and Moral Science at the University of Arizona. As some of you may know, the University of Arizona and UPC have built a strategic partnership in the last few years, which uh, starting on March, has begun to offer Peruvian students the possibility to enroll in University of Arizona programs and earn a bachelor's and master's degree from a highly prestigious university. That is one of the reasons why having Dr. Goss tonight with us is very significant. But we also know that his presence in this seminar will give everybody a small taste of what this partnership looks like. Dr. Goss is a prolific author who has more than nine books. He has published nine books so far, and the talk he's going to share with us today stems from ideas he puts forward in the 10th and most recent book he's publishing, The Open Society and Its Complexities. I can personally say Dr. Goss is an enthralling lecturer because I have the pleasure to be one of his co-instructors this semester in a potentially hard topic such as classics in the history of political economy. And yet his passion for the subject and for authors such as Plato or uh, David Ricardo makes it a joy to follow. Dr. Goss will deliver his talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will introduce a panel led by our own president and CEO, Marisol Suarez Portugal, who we are very happy to have with us tonight. So without further ado, I leave you now with Dr. Jerry Goss. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. These are terrible times for the world. And I feel very fortunate that nevertheless, we're able to re reflect about questions that I'm gonna raise about the nature of diversity, the nature of our society, and the nature of governance in the society we created. I don't see the, in these remarks themselves, they don't reflect directly on the COVID, the COVID crisis, but I think you'll see by the end that the COVID crisis is behind a lot of the things I'm thinking about. And later on, if you'd like, we could talk about how I think the things I'm talking about are actually really relevant to what we should be doing to rebound from the disasters that we experience. So I will share the screen because I do have PowerPoint. And share it. And we will start it. And that should be starting it. Um, if it's not, people should tell me they can't see. So let me again talk about open society and its complexity. My theme is that we've created a new sort of society that we don't quite understand. So let's begin by asking, oops, let me see, I'm already something's not working. I'm sorry, my screen is locked. So as typical with these sorts of episodes, having it, it's not working. Hmm, PowerPoint seems to lock up. So, hmm, we'll try again in a cell, try to reload it. So we'll try to end the show and start over again. Maybe this will work. Slide. Ah, it's working. There you go. The nature of technology. Just start it over again and everything gets fixed. So what is the open society? It's not fixed. <laughs> this is very, so what's, the sharing screen does not seem to be working on my PowerPoint. Let this work. Yes. All right, I think we find, 
Well, I can't go backwards and I can't go forwards. It allows me to do one or two, but I think this might just clicking. All right, I got it. Let's do it this way. There's always a way. So let's see if that works. What is the open society? It's tempting to see the open society. In this, I'm sorry, you're gonna get this view. Let me see if I can expand it so you don't see all that. Uh, let me see, you can at least see that. So it's technically the open society is simply another name for a progressive society with extensive liberty to innovate. This is a traditional view from John Stuart Mill on. As, human increase their, as humans increase their powers of reasoning and civilization, morality advances, we become more rational and more critical. On this view, reason interrogates existing customs and practices that are founded on force and superstition. An open society, as Popper said, is putting aside a magical society to begin a society founded on reason, freedom, and equality. In this talk, although Popper did say this, I want to suggest a more radical view, that the open society is a, a different sort of society. It's a society that we've created without fully understanding how it works, that it's a new society based on a much deeper notion of diversity than we've ever experienced before. And in particular, I wanna suggest that this new society poses grave problems for governance. We have an idea of what it is to govern the open society, which I think is inappropriate to the nature of the society we've created. So. In this talk, in the rest of the talk, I want to do a few things. First, I'll begin by describing what I shall call autocatalytic diversity, which is a diversity which creates more diversity. And I want to get into that by contrasting two understandings of the division of labor, starting with Adam Smith. Then I want to explain what makes the open society this diverse society, this autocatalytic diverse society, a complex social system, what I mean by a complex social system, and why the open society is a complex system. And in part four, I want to provide a simulation, uh, the results of a simulation, which show, I think, a serious challenge that the complexity poses to the social aims of governing the open society. So I'll begin talking about this idea of self-generating diversity, explain why self-generating diversity leads to complexity, and then show how complexity leads to the problems of governance and why some traditional understanding of governance is inconsistent with the nature of an open society. So let me begin then with two accounts of the division of labor. A common interpretation of Smith's pin factory, as Omar said, one of the things they teach is history of political economy. We all read Adam Smith. And we read in the early chapter Smith's description of a pin factory, which he actually took from a French encyclopedia. In this description, as most of us know, Smith estimated that a worker could by himself make 20 pins a day, but by dividing the process into 10 subtasks, such as one person straightens the wire, another person puts the heads on, another person sharpens the pin, per worker output could be increased to 5,000 pins a day. And for Smith, this tremendous ability to divide up tasks, many people think is the key to the efficiency of the division of labor. And this idea, which I call sort of a static efficiency idea, the division of labor just divides up known tasks into the component parts. The entire task was known by everyone, and the division simply allows us to separate those into the different workers and complementary functions. So if you think of the division of labor in this way, it's something like distributing a fixed available stock of jobs. For example, Smith, there's a job of straightening the pin, a job of sharpening it, a job of putting a head on, and there's a fixed stock of these. And what we want to do is distribute them in the most efficient way. And if we do that, we get a game something like this. Here is a two-person game between Alf and Betty. They either can, they want to build a house, 
One can specialize in roofs and one can specialize in structure. Both could specialize in roofs, both could specialize in structure, or they may not specialize at all. The problem if you specialize in structure, of course, is that you're not gonna be at all good at putting roofs on. You may make really bad roofs because your specialty is structures. And the same thing, if you specialize in roofs, you won't be able to make very good structures. So the way this game works is that, suppose that Alf specializes in roofs and Ben specializes in roofs. Then they get a really low payoff of one, one. In this game, three is tops and one is bad because they both specialize in roofs. So that means they really can't make structures. And so they lose out in the division of labor. Another possibility is that Alf specializes in roofs, roofs and Betty specializes in structures. This leads to a really nice result, three out of three, where they get, uh, they make houses much more efficiently. Each, as the Smith's pin factory, does a special job. And rather than making one bad house, they can make two good houses in a day, say. What if, however, Alf specializes in structures and Betty specializes in roofs? roofs? Again, that's a good outcome because they employ the division of labor. What if Alf doesn't specialize? Well, if Alf doesn't specialize and Betty doesn't specialize, they get a payoff of two, two. They each can build their own houses, unlike when they specialize and they specialize in the same thing. They actually can build the house. You just don't build the house very efficiently. And those of you who will take PPL 310, if you're here, you'll recognize this as what's called a stag hunt game. And there's three equilibrium in this game. They could either both end up specializing one elf in structure and Betty in roof. They might not specialize at all as an equilibrium in this game, or they might again um, specialize. Betty specializes in structure and elf specializes in roofs. And there's game um, understandings of the division of labor which see it this way. Uh, some people have developed the stag hunt as an example of what Smith had in mind by the division of labor. I want to suggest, although this is Plitz and Smith, the pin factory really is just Smith's way of making an important point vivid, but he doesn't want to think we're simply distributing a fixed stock of jobs. And in any way, the way I want to think about the division of labor is a much more dynamic. And I want to draw on Stuart Kaufman. Stuart Kaufman is, I think, one of the most original and brilliant minds of our time. Sir Kaufman is a physicist, he's a theorist of evolution, and he has also worked on economics. And in all of his work, it's been extraordinarily innovative. And I want to draw on his work to rethink the division of labor, which causes us to rethink the nature of our society, I think. So Kaufman has recently proposed a similarity between the explosion of diversity in the biosphere and the explosion of diversity in the economy. And the word explosion is important because the growth of the biosphere and more importantly, the growth of the economy has been exponential. Here's how Kaufman puts it. We seem to make our worlds and thereby make room for one another. As we make our worlds, we make room for other people in our worlds. Each makes more opportunities for others in its adjacent niches or rooms. I'm gonna to try to explain this idea of an adjacent possible niche. But as we do something, we create possible niches for others. And the economy, he says, is like the worms coming to live in swim, in swim bladders. And he actually does a lot of comparisons between the economy and, and um, some biological organisms. And the important thing is the possibilities explode faster than the number of occupants you can occupy. Even Smith thought the market expands as the number of people in it expands. Uh, Kaufman wants to argue that the possibilities of the market expand exponentially, even faster than the number of participants, even though those participants create those niches. And what I want to do is look at this idea of what's called exponential growth of the adjacent possible and suggest that the open society has experienced this, ex this exponential growth of the adjacent possible it has made a society which is more complex than in some sense we actually understand. So let me explore this idea, which may not be at first intelligible to you, of the dynamic growth of the adjacent possible. We can think in terms of the push and pull of diversity. That is, I want to suggest that as you create some niche, 
It pushes, the, it pushes out the boundaries of the possible by creating other new niches, and I'm gonna call that the supply side of diversity. For example, an existing technology or service or idea provides the basis for the creation of the next technology, service, or idea. To develop technology X is to provide the basis for a variety of new technologies, but the possibility space of these new technologies is unbounded. This leads us to what Kaufman calls the principle of indefiniteness, the indefiniteness of functional searches. This principle says that there is no boundary to the adjacent possible development of the uses of technology. So again, to try to focus in on this idea, Kaufman says this, please list for me all the uses of a screwdriver in say New York City in 2017. Well, go ahead. You could screw in a screw, open a can of paint, scrape putty from a window, stab someone, display it as an object of art, scratch your back, wedge the door, prop the window open, jam the door closed, tie it to a stick and spear a fish, rent that spear out at 5% of the local catch, and on and on and on. That is, what Kaufman is insisting is there can be no predictive theory of the evolution of the screwdriver or of the evolution of the economy, since the possibility space of what that can be used for itself can't be determined. Let me then give an example from technology. There's a lot of cool examples in technology, and I know this is a little abstract. So let's look at some particular technologies, and I'll be looking at them. For example, consider one, which is the amplifier circuit. The amplifier circuit was the development of a vacuum tube, the triode, the triode vacuum tube, that made possible another invention called the oscillator, and those inventions collectively made possible radio broadcasting. One invention allowed for the possibility of new niches as those niches were filled, yet other niches were filled, and from the amplifier circuit eventually came radio broadcasting. In the history of technology, this tale is told again and again and again. At each step along the way, the ability to make a move was made possible by the previous technological moves already made on which the latest move capitalized. We can call this a tinkering model of innovation, and it's critical to much technological change. The idea that gray ideas come out of the heads of a lone thinker is, if you look at the history of innovation, is actually very rare. Innovation comes out of previous innovation, which people are then trying to figure out the adjacent possible to a previous innovation. And so in that way, I want to say that technological growth is autocatalytic. The more innovations there are, the greater the space of the adjacent possible. More innovations, which allows for even more innovations, once again, expanding the adjacent possible. Because innovation is autocatalytic in this way, one of the best predictors of how much innovation they will, there will be is the present degree of diversity. For that degree of diversity is constantly expanding the space of the adjacent possible. Uh, here's the way Kaufman puts it, as the adjacent possible drives the development of the market itself. We looked at biology, consider some examples from technology, and I'll consider more, but here's how Kaufman puts it in terms of the market itself. As new goods and services and production capacities come into existence, they provide the growing context in which yet more new goods and services and production capacities can follow as their complements or substitutes. An economy with a high diversity of goods, services, and production functions rather like a garage full of stuff rather than a clean garage. Kaufman and I both have filled garages. It's easier to jury rig, and an English jury rig is to take all sorts of different things and make something of it, to put them together to solve a problem. If you have a, a leaking pipe, you might jury rig it with tape and glue and some wood to hold it up. So jury rig is to, to figure out a way to bring things together to solve a problem. So he's talking about jury rig. So it's easier to jury rig in a garage full of stuff, and it's easier to invent new goods and services and, and production functions in an economy already filled with such stuff. 
but the new goods, services, and production functions only make the garage more full of stuff. Thus, amazingly, the economy grows its own adjacent possible and augments that very growth as that growth appears. This process is self-accelerating. What I mean by an autocatalytic process is a self-accelerating process. It feeds at itself and, in fact, speeds up as it goes along. And that's the way I want to argue diversity is in our society. That was about the push of diversity, how once you create a niche, all sorts of new niches uh, are possible. And so we can think of technological and other innovations as pushing the boundaries of the possible. But it's also the case that as one engages in this niche creation, one is creating the possibility of new functions that others can see and that they actually try to fulfill these new niches. For example, one niche calls forth unknown new niches. We see, oh, now that we have this, we need that too. Here, the possible is drawing us into it. It's not simply that we're being pushed into the new world. The new world is drawing us in because, well, we can see that there's an easy thing to do here, or at least maybe an easy for someone, and there's a niche that could be filled. How are we going to fill it? And let me quote here at some length Brian Arthur. Brian Arthur is one of the foremost theorists of complexity and of technological innovation and the nature of technological innovation. So let me uh, quote from Arthur since he knows so much. And here's what Brian Arthur says. Growth in coevolutionary diversity. And note right at the beginning that coevolutionary diversity equally applies to biology and economics. Growth in coevolutionary diversity can be seen in the economy in the way specialized products and processes within the computer industry have proliferated in the last two decades. As modern microprocessors processors came into existence, they created niches. Notice that Arthur is using exactly the terms that Kaufman does. Kaufman, the philosopher of biology and physics, Arthur, the economist, are, have converged on this idea of a niche. They created niches for devices such as memory systems, screen monitors, and bus interfaces that could be connected with them to form useful hardware computing devices. These in turn created a need or a niche for new operating systems, software and programming languages, and for software applications. The existence of such hardware and software in turn made possible desktop publishing, computer-aided design and manufacturing, electronic mail, shared computer networks, and so on. This created niches for laser printers, engineering design software and hardware, and network servers, modems, transmission systems. These new devices in turn called forth, here's no, now we're thinking about the, the poll, called forth further new microprocessors and system software to drive them. And so in about two decades, the computer industry has undergone an explosive increase in diversity from a small number of devices and software to a very large number as new devices make possible further new devices and new software products make possible new functions for computers. These in turn call forth, again, this is the pull, new devices and new software. So we have the push to increasing diversity. As, as we develop new niches, all sorts of other niches become possible. And we have a pull towards more diversity. Having developed a niche, we can see the possibility of a new function and we work on fulfilling that function. These two things together, the push of the current innovation and the pull of the possible innovation creates what I think is a self-fueling and increasing growth of diversity in our modern societies. So the first thing I wanna say about the open society, it is the society of autocatalytic diversity. It's generating constantly increasing rates of diversity in the sense that it's exploded in diversity. Second question that I wanted to answer is given diversity, how does this relate to complexity, which is the uh, theme of my talk? What about complexity and diversity? Well, the growth of diversity I've just said is autocatalytic. As culture, technology, and the market becomes more diverse, the space of the adjacent possible explodes, innovation creates more possibilities, which when realized create a larger adjacent possible. However, diversity does not imply complexity. 
Human height is very diverse, but human height is not very complex. It doesn't form a complex system. It, it, it's a complicated system with a great deal of diversity in it. We have lots of times where we have diversity, but not complexity. But on the other, however, I want to argue that autocatalytic diversity is the sort of diversity that has created complexity. So diversity doesn't imply complexity, but it provides the foundation for complexity. And how does it provide? Through increasingly dense connections. Complexity arises when the behavior of heterogeneous, diverse elements is connected such that the functioning of one part or one element affects many, many others. Variation in behavior of one element feeds back into the variation of others, and that affects others and so on. Sometimes these radiating consequences can be halted. For example, a circuit breaker is a way to, to break these radiating implications, or they can be dampened. In contemporary stock markets, they automatically impose trading uh, blocks for a short time to slow down cascades of trading. And that happened for the first time in the New York Stock Exchange in March. So there's times when these dense interactions can be stopped, what's called cascades can be stopped, but nevertheless, although sometimes you want to slow them down, complex systems can't function unless their elements do interact. Sometimes the interaction becomes so great that chaos or cascades uh, swamp the system, but without deep interconnections, uh, complex systems can't function. And we can think of this in the biological metaphor, that the niches depend on each other. And we're seeing that in this COVID crisis. To cut off a connection is to cut off one's food supply to interacting niches. We think we're closing off one niche and we close off many niches through that because the niches are interactive and dependent on each other and to affect one affects the entire system. Let me give another technological example because they do help us to bring down this sort of complicated idea into a more tractable. Again, and again, it's Arthur, who I think is one of the best theorists of technology. This is the original, this is the jet engine. Amazingly, the original jet engine had one part. It was probably the simplest of all things. It had a compressor turbine. Uh, fuel was fed and lit, and things went forward. That was the jet engine. Current jet engines have 22,000 parts. Efficiency was enhanced by adding a number of, the number of compressors linked into a system, then adding variable vanes to regulate air intake, then airflow systems to reduce overheating, and on and on and on 22,000 times. What started as a remarkably simple one-part system has now become a highly complex system through expanding the adjacent possible. The complexity arose from innovations in the space of the adjacent possible, which led to increasingly complicated networks of innovation. Each innovation made for a more complex jet engine, which then provided the basis for the next intervention, which connected to yet new systems that previously were independent. But to be successful, of course, the next innovation has to work with the existing set. So the functions of the innovations were critically linked into that functional network that we call the contemporary jet engines. And this network goes far beyond the simple internal functioning of the engine, it's 22,000 parts, to include the development of alloys and computer systems linking the jet engine to the rest of aircraft and beyond. Perfect example of autocatalytic diversity. So once we have this diversity and this diversity is linked through the adjacent possible growing and connecting itself to other parts of the system, we not only have diversity, but now we have diversity entering in to deep complexity of the system, deep interconnections, one part affecting another. The system functions in many ways much, much better. The contemporary jet engines are faster, more fuel efficient, quieter, but they're incredibly more complicated and are subject to more types of failure. I want to now pause and say, okay, we looked at these very theoretical issues. We looked at diversity and this trying to draw this idea of diversity and expanding the adjacent possible. I've said how the adjacent possible is end up always connecting to new pieces of the adjacent possible, much more like biology than typical economic analysis, and this creates diversity. But we're, I'm a political philosopher, and I'm interested in governance. 
given the system that we've created, how can we govern it? And the book I'm writing is about partially governing such systems. In this talk, I can't talk about how we should govern the system, but in this talk, I can say something about why a traditional notion of governance, which we've often used, looks like it's inappropriate for this complex system. And that's a notion of governance based on collective goals. Most policy governance seeks to maximize the values of some type of social goal, economic growth, health, or education. Now, each of these really is a set of closely linked variables. It's not just one thing called health. Growth or, or growth, right? Growth can concern, concern itself with GDP growth, employment growth. We might be concerned with manufacturing growth. Health can involve longevity. Health can be days without chronic disability, rates of serious disease, et cetera. So we talk about health or growth. We're actually talking about a system of variables, and we're, again, introducing complexity. I want to just simplify for a moment and forget about that complexity and just assume that we have something that we can actually have some single discrete thing we're aiming at that isn't itself a bundle of things, right? So think of a, a single discrete goal, which I have in mind here. What I want to just look at briefly is what are the problems for a government that just tries to secure this single uh, a goal in an increasingly complex and diverse in society? Well, let me begin with what I call the multiple regression view of the world, which is partially successful. The core tools of most economics, something like multiple, uh, most policy studies, are multiple regression and vector analysis. When we do policy studies, we do something often like multiple regression and vector analysis. What do I mean by this? To greatly simplify, these methods recognize that the target policy, call that W, is affected by many other variables. If we want to know what growth is, how we're going to produce growth, or how we're going to rate, increase the rate of growth, we have to look at things like rates of education, perhaps, or we have to look at uh, property rights protection, rule of law protection. There are many causal factors that feed into the rate of growth, and we know that if we want to predict the rate of growth and manipulate it, there's going to be a number of causal factors which affect the rate of growth, and one of the things a multiple regression analysis does is allows us to try to apportion the degree of influence of each of the variables that help affect the variable. So we might want to say, well, how much does education affect growth? How much does the rule of law affect growth? And a multiple regression analysis tries to do that. It accepts that there's multiple causes and then tries to say, well, what are the relative causal influence of all of these particular inputs into our interest, our target variable? This is then what I want to call a many-to-one analysis. We take many factors, many causal influences, and we seek to explain their, their impact on our target variable. This, in a, a real simple depiction, is a many-to-one relation. We have a target variable. We have three different causal influences on it. And one of the things we'd like to do is to apportion how much influence each of the variables have and we might run a multiple regression analysis to try to do that. When we have these sort of singular social goals, policy scientists have uncovered significant regret to indicate some causal factors influencing a target variable at some time. Maybe you haven't done so good at growth, but we've done good at some other variables. Um, in fact, empirical studies like those of Tetlock show that we can Good predictors can predict discrete events and variables within the range of six months to three or even five years. Like Tetlock did a wonderful study on super forecasters, where he asked uh, people in large studies to forecast all sorts of events. Uh, so we can think of events as like a single uh, variable. Will this happen or won't that happen? And he found that from six months to three years, sometimes to five, super efficient forecasters can accurately predict what's going to happen. Interestingly, which is we can talk about this later, in a complex system, after about five years, the best predictors revert to chance. There's almost no ability to increase upon chance after five years. But nevertheless, if we have a discrete variable from the short to the medium turn, 
regression analysis formally, informally, super forecasters can predict what that variable is going to be and get some handle on the causal uh, forces operating on it. So far, complexity hasn't hit. Complexity hits, I want to argue, when we have a wide range of social goals, not just one, not just two, but many. Governments just don't seek one or a few goals. They seek many goals. Um, we not only care about economic growth, we care about environmental protection, we care about healthy lives, secure retirement, employment protection, higher wages, affordable housing, interesting work, leisure, safety, privacy, equity, social mobility, and on and on. Uh, governments have many goals they're trying to simultaneously pursue. Now remember, this is going to, the multiple regression says there's many factors at a single goal. Now we're talking on many goals that you're trying to pursue. It's here that we're going to get real problems of complexity. And that's because the target of one policy is an input into another policy. The one department wants to target variable W and tries to manipulate W, but for another, W is one of the things that feeds into its goals. And so we have a much more complicated relationship. Not only do we have the many to one relationship, which regression analysis handles, whereby Y and Z affect X, but X itself is one of the factors that affects another social goal, Z. And I want to call this a many to one to many relation. And here's the problem of complexity. We have many that affect X, but X itself is part of the causal influence of many other variables. So we have a many to one to many relationship. I want to suggest that this many-to-one-to-many -to -many relationship confounds traditional social policy aiming at pursuing a, a multitude of specific social goals. I did this through running a simulation just to show the dynamics. All right, so let me just exp uh, explain before closing the short simulation I ran. It's a very simple simulation. In this simulation, there's an eight variable set. So we have a world with only eight things that are important. Um, and in this variable set, each variable has some ties to either positive or negative, two of the other variables in the set. <coughs> this is no means a maximally complex system. In a maximally complex system, every variable affects every other. In this system, and I think it was moderately complex, Every variable is affected by a quarter of the other variables. So it's nothing close to maximal complexity. It's nevertheless a complex system in the sense that each variable is affected by two of the other variables in the eight system set. In this system, the influence on a relation of a variable can either be positive or negative. If it's positive, an increase in x increases y's value. It's negative, obviously, an increase in x value decreases uh, b's value, the other value of the variable it affects. So the influence factor on b, say uh, x influences b, this influence factor can either be moderate or weak. Both the positive, negative, and strong and weak relations are determined randomly for each influence. So for example, if a's influence is both positive and moderate on b, A's value increases B's by 0.2. If A's influence on B is weak and negative, A's value decreases B by one. So we have variables that their values are partially affected by the values of others to a modest extent, either 0.1 or 0.2, and they can either be affected positively or negatively by these other variables. That's the basic setup. Let me just go through the formulas really quickly to just give you an idea Tell you exactly what happens, not that the formulas themselves are that important, but just so you get a feeling for what the dynamics of the simulation were. So we had eight systems, uh, eight variables in our system. Four of these are going to be targeted variables. These are the variables that the government wants to change. There's four other variables in the system which the government, let's assume, isn't interested in changing. It's not one of their, their policy priorities. So here's the way a variable uh, equation would look. We'd have uh, variable A in period I is affected first of all by its value in the previous period, whatever it was in period two, 
will be affected by what it was in period one. Then we're going to add one to it. We're going to assume that in every period, the government has one unit of investment, which increases the overall value of A. The government's trying to intervene to promote A. It's going to give one unit of investment into A in every period. And the simulation runs 25 periods, which means that each of the target variables, the government will put 25 units of investment in. In this particular equation, we see that A is negatively affected by E. As E goes up, A will go down by 0.1. And in this particular equation, A is also negatively affected by B. As B goes up, A will go down by 0.2. So um, we can see how we calculate the value of A for period I depends on A's value in period I, E's value in period uh, I minus one, and E's, B's period. Uh, value in B minus one. And just here on the other occasions that we do the same thing. In each of these four target variables, we're adding one unit of investment for each of the four um, variables. Then we have the untargeted variables, and I'll go through it once more. Try to again try to clarify what's happening. So what is E's value in period I? Well, it's going to be E's value in period I minus one. But we're not adding anything to it because it's not a target variable, so we're not adding the one. But in this case, E is positively affected by C's value, and it's also positively affected weakly by G's value. And again, for all the non-target variables, we have something like that. So to recap the story in our simulation, our governor is interested in pursuing four variables that impact on each other, and these four variables are connected to four other variables. Perhaps the governor doesn't know of these connections, or even if the governor knows of them, they can't be manipulated. But the governor is able to successfully invest one unit in each of its four target variables in every period of the 25 period simulation, which means that over the 25 period simulation, the government invests 100 units in these four variables. Every variable starts with an initial value of five. If these were simple linear investments, starting with an initial value of five, investing one over 25 periods, every variable should have added up with 30 units of investment, uh, or a total of 120 for the entire system. So, what actually happened? Something quite surprisingly happened here. For me, this, was the, this is actually the first run of the model. Well, the impact of each variable and the others was strictly linear. I went through those equations because you see they're very simple linear equations where a variable is just affected by its previous value, add something to it, and um, discount it or increase it by another variable. There's no particular complicated linear relations here. The system itself, as is the nature of complex systems, is distinctly nonlinear with a tipping point around period 21 which drove the values of the target variables sharply downward. Up to period 20, it looked like the policy intervention was succeeding. It looked like we're doing exactly what we wanted to do, but the hidden dynamics of the other four variables were about to swamp the policy intervention. By the end, the target variables have lost half their initial value, going from an aggregate of 20 to about an aggregate of 10, despite a 100 unit investment by the governor. And as we have seen characteristically of complex systems, for a bit, up to 20, the system looked pretty predictable. It looked like we were basically adding investment to a system. We weren't maybe getting the full return, but it looked like we were getting a good return. Suddenly, the system collapses. Interestingly, most of us think something happened. There must be an exogenous shock. Everything was going so, so beautifully. Interestingly, though, the reason the system crashed was implicit in the system right from the beginning, and it was the nature of the complex relations. Let's consider another interpretation, though. You know, my interpretation was four variables the government was interested in, four it wasn't. Um, what if it was interested in all of the eight variables, but it could only manipulate four of them? It could invest in four of them, but it really was concerned with all eight. If that's the case, we not only want to know how the value of the four targeted variables came out, we'd like to know how the variables, all eight variables came out. 
And interestingly, when we look at all eight variables, we get a really different looking system. And again, this is indicative of complexity. The more variables we're adding, the more nonlinear the system gets. And this is interesting. We find that the overall system began to improve after the period one, period uh, 21 tipping point, when the four variables collapsed, the others grew exponentially. At period 25, all eight values finally exceeded their initial value of 40, although the four targeted variables were actually less valued than they started. This is highly nonlinear, highly unexpected. There's two points where the system turns and changes direction, and the only difference was simply the initial five units, one unit of investment, and very simple linear relations between the variables. And this is one of the things about complex systems, where simple relations connected give rise to highly unpredictable and highly nonlinear overall results. I think this is an interesting example. Um, in the real world, we tend to think that these tipping points, something must have happened. We were doing well and suddenly we started doing badly. But in fact, what I want to just intuitively help you see is that the system was doing this all along, but the results accumulated in unexpected ways at unexpected times. So let me conclude then on the open and closed societies. First of all, the closed society. I think the traditional goal-based governance, where we have a lot of things we're trying to do, actually would require simplifying society by disconnecting the niches. And that's making it more closed. To successfully pursue lots of social goals, we'd have to have a simpler, less connected, and less diverse system than we have. Moreover, I don't think this can be done in a piecemeal way. Um, Close off a few possible parts of the adjacent possible is not going to make the society less diverse because the adjacent possible is always greater than we can fill anyway. So if you close off some things in the adjacent possible, many other parts of the adjacent possible will be filled and autocatalytic diversity will continue on its merry way. If you really want to cut off the adjacent possible and its exploration and the increasing diversity, which inherently follows from it, you're going to have to really box off the adjacent possible. You're going to make it very difficult for people to do new things. It's not going to be something that's going to be modest. It's going to have to be, as proper and high extent, a closed society where you really do try to close off the adjacent possible. I think there's all sorts of reasons why we don't want to do that. If we don't want to do that, then we have to rethink what it is to govern such a society. We can't successfully pursue multiple goals at multiple times. What might we do? Well, in this talk, it's a conclusion, so I'm not going to give a lot of arguments, but let me just point to some things we can do. I don't think it's a, a, um, a talk where we're supposed to be pessimistic that we can't govern our societies. My point in my talk is we can govern them, but we have to have new ways of governing them and think about governance in new ways. One of the ways which is important to think about it is in terms of resilience. The open society will definitely, no matter what, experience unexpected shocks. Schumpeter called these waves of creative destruction. Sometimes, as in the COVID-19, it's not very creative, but it's the nature of the open society to have tipping points when the society quickly changes. There's no way to, to, make, to ensure that we don't have unexpected shocks. Given that we don't have unexpected shocks, given that we can't eliminate them, we need institutions that are resilient. In this sense, they allow society and the economy to reorganize itself after the ma aftermath of these gales of destruction. For example, a social safety net um, is one way which we can promote resilience. Social safety nets allow people to readjust their activities, to readjust their goals, to readjust their appointments, without being pushed to the edge of survival. And that allows people to reevaluate what needs to be done. So social safety nets are probably crucial to resilience. The government, to a large extent, recent governments have tried to promote resilience by keeping employment going as far as possible. On the other hand, we have to be sure there's, to promote resilience is not to make sure that nothing changes. 
resilience is to make sure that people have the resources to reorder their activities. Another thing though, which is crucial, is to preserve diversity. I'm sort of a fan of diversity in many, many ways, but diversity is critical for the open society to exist. And here, the, we can again go to a biological analysis and diverse ecosystems are not subject to collapse, whereas monocultures and simpler ecosystems are. Uh, people who like planning, like very simple ecosystems, we planned out gardens, but the problem with gardens is that one disease can wipe out a garden. And the problem with a simple society is that it's functioning very well, but when it has an exogenous shock, it can be wiped out. Diverse systems, although they have more shocks, are more able to readjust themselves because there's more resources to draw on new adjacent possibles to readjust their activities. So we have the, the paradox of diversity. The diversity makes shocks more inevitable, more inevitable, make them inevitable, but it also makes us able to recover from them. Simplicity makes shocks less likely, but when they occur, often makes them disastrous. One thing we do want to, though, avoid, which is a temptation, is to lock in rules and procedures that solve the last crisis, but lessens the resilience for the next. We're very tempted to do that. We think we know what happened, and we lock ourselves into procedures that will prevent that. But often those procedures that prevent that cause the new crisis. My favorite example is the Maginot Line. The French society was devastated by the French World War in World War I. And reasonably facing the crisis which destroyed a generation of the French, they resolved they would have no more trench warfare. And they built a system of tunnels and fortifications between Germany and France that would prevent Germany from invading France. The problem is that warfare became mobile. Germany went around the Maginot Line into Belgium and defeated France. France, as they said, prepared excellently for the last war. The problem with locking in solutions for the last war is that we don't have the diversity needed to consider solutions for the next war. So we need resilience, we need diversity. At the same time, no matter what we do, we have to avoid locking in our procedures that solve this crisis because those very procedures might be the ones that cause the next crisis. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear Jerry, uh, I, I found your presentation extremely useful and valuable for a country like Peru. The word that you gave us, resilience in an open economy, and to avoid lockdowns and simple solutions, and to get the, the diversity flourish, make me a lot hopeful about Peru and most of the world. It was a extremely uh, hopeful and enlightening speech. But in my, in the, my case, I just want to introduce to our uh, CEO, Marisol Suarez, who is going to make the closing remarks tonight. Please, Marisol. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gauss. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jensen, for reminding me for this. It was a pleasure to rethink through your words the complexities of the open society these days. The COVID-19 crisis challenges us from the very bottom here in Peru and across the world. For us, there are clear elements for reflection in your speech and new book, which seeks to explain why the promise of the open society. Challenges that emerge especially after World War and today implies a still open arena of philosophical and economic discussions. Here, as partners in the University of Arizona, UPC microcampus, we are very proud to give our students an opportunity to be part of it. In fact, the first group of students enrolled in the dual degree program between Arizona and UPC are lucky enough to have Jerry deliver the first two courses that we'll ever take as students 
of the University of Arizona in their Lima campus. It is time to get rid of the epistemic arrogance has created a gap in society that is actually undercutting its progress and has turned the friends of the open society into the same tribal of sectarian group they once denounced as their main threat. We thank you for your powerful message that can easily be applied to our own reality in Peru and that we should do well in considering as we face the task of rebuilding our stumbling societies after once in a lifetime talk. Thank you very much, Professor. Omar? Thank you very much. I was muted. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm mute. Uh, I'm a perpetual yeah. unmuter, but uh, thank you very much. Um, it was a wonderful talk to you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I hope it was interesting. I do think it has relevant. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I do have a, a question from, uh, Anne. well, thank you. First of all, Jerry, it was a very, uh, uh, very interesting talk you delivered to us. Uh, it has been, uh, there was a lot of, 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 of people hearing you. But I have one specific question from our, our own Alfredo Garcia, who is the, our, our head of research here at the university. And, uh, and he, he, he tells me to ask you this, which could be the similarities and differences between your proposal and Maturana's idea of autopoiesis, autocatalytic, Nicholas Luhmann's idea of functions in social systems and Edgar Morin's idea of complexity? That is a large question that also involves literature that I'm not entirely uh, acquainted with. I will say that um, one of the things that complexity analysis and Kaufman re reinvigorates is the idea of functional analysis. Uh, science, uh, especially the social sciences, have been suspicious of functional analysis, but biologists can't do evolutionary theory without functional analysis. And you, you can't explain evolution without saying the function of the heart is. And one of the things I wanted to stress with the poll part of diversity is that the functional analysis of the development of complexity is absolutely necessary. We can't do without functional analysis. And philosophers and social scientists have to come to grips with one way or another functional analysis is a, an important part of any adequate explanation of social growth and diversity. Um, inadequate, but there you have it. All right. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if uh, Carlos, Marisol, somebody else wants to add, add some, some, something else to the, or ask Jerry anything else? Uh, no, yes, thank you very much. It, it, it's been great. And, and as Carlos says, uh, all this complexity that we are facing right now, we, re, we really need uh, resilience, diversity, and think over and over again and ensure that 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 equation goes to a positive pen. I believe so. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about in the talk is the importance of reflexivity uh, when creating another level of diversity. And reflexivity is that the governor can give instructions, but he can't decide what people are going to do with the instructions. People react to the patterns they make. They react to the governor. And in my book, I talk about the World Bank. And in their governance report, they said, we off, too often thought of governors as controlling the system, where governors are an actor in the system. They try to affect behavior, but what sorts of effect on the behavior they have is up to the citizens themselves. And so there's a complicated interaction between what the governor says to do and what citizens do. And we know this from the, the shutdowns of our societies. The governments can say things, but what citizens do and their reactions are entirely different. This leads to another level of complexity, so that my level of complexity was still determinate. The government can make something happen. It could invest in one unit. But at that point, the government's investment may not be something accepted by the citizens at all. And that leads to even more complexity. And I think one of the important things about the COVID crisis is that we realize that the complexity of citizens' responses 
can do or undo the nature of government policies. Absolutely. Dear Jerry, I have a poisoning question. What oh, would oh. you think that Karl Popper would think about the recent complexities of the open society in just a few years? I, I, I have complicated views about Popper. Um, sometimes Popper, I think, says what I think is correct about the nature of the open society and that it's this autocad, you know, much diversity and freedom are the core of it. But at other times, there's a sort of rationalism about Kyle Popper that we just do enough experiments, we'll figure things out. Uh, we should just you know, have piecemeal social engineering. And I have a student who wrote a dissertation on complexity, and he and I constantly argued because he believed that we can experiment successfully in complex systems. And when I looked at the data, we can only experiment successfully at very small levels. So I, I believe the experimentations of uh, randomized control trials on poverty has been very successful because we can repeat them in multiple places and multiple times. But Popper talked about big scale social experiments and I'm very skeptical of big scale social experiments. We don't know the conditions, we don't know why they happen, we can't replicate them, we don't know what conclusions to draw. So when Popper starts talking about social experiments, I get much more suspicious because I think that the people who talk about ex social experiments are much more like what Lindblom called muddling through, seeing what happens. And we don't really know why it worked or didn't work. So the more you get this experimentation, rationalistic Popper, the more I think he Hayek much deeper understood complexity and understood the indeterminacies of uh, complex systems. Thank you very much. I agree with you. Uh, Omar. Omar has some messages. To yes, write. I'll just want to thank Jerry again for uh, sharing this talk with us tonight. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Uh, uh, I know what people were getting, so uh, I'm happy that everybody could see what but some of us are very lucky to have every Wednesday night, at least. Um, <laughs> And uh, for the rest of for the rest of people hearing um, this, is, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first uh, episode of our international brown bag seminars. And next week uh, there will be there will be an announcement for our next guest, who is uh, Roberto Chang, a Peruvian economist who is currently at uh, Rutgers University, uh, and he will deliver a talk on the a role of. Uh, um, Economic policy, policy um, given this, uh, this, uh, what we're living today. Um, I think that's that's it for for everybody. It's a, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you again. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Consider well. this your home, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jerry. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Uf, me olvidé, para los que están por ahí todavía hay una encuesta al final de la conexión, si por favor la pueden completar, se los agradeceremos mucho y muchas gracias por asistir.